to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. And in today's episode, we are going to bring you a very important, high-level, very thought-provoking discussion and interview with Major Mike Burns, who is a member of the RPA, or Remotely Piloted Aircraft, community. His AFSC is 11 Uniform, but that is not the only AFSC, as you will learn, in that is part of the RPA community. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. I thought he brought up a lot of really good points. And I think the thing that I really liked about this, and we didn't even talk about this, Colin, in our you know little prep session we had before this, this job didn't even exist not all that long ago. Right. You know, like this is kind of, you know, we've bemoaned the fact that the DOD is not pushing tech like it used to. You know, we don't always have the bestest, the coolest, the most, this, the newest. This is one area which we were kind of out front. Yeah. You know, I fly planes from a Connex box in Las Vegas over, you know, that I just think that's cool. Yeah, definitely a lot of innovation, both in the tech and in the thought process is, as well as the interactions between people, a lot is happening within the RPA community. And we really appreciate Major Burns, Mike, for taking the time to explain a little bit of all that to us. I mean, there is so much going on here. We couldn't touch on absolutely everything, but the things that we were able to cover and, and have a conversation around, I think is extremely valuable to our audience and certainly taught me a lot about what's going on within our Air Force. Yeah, one of the most cogent discussions on air power, airplanes, air force that I've listened to in a long time. Yep. So let's turn the time over to Major Mike Burns there. Okay, Mike Burns, welcome to the show. We are super excited to have you here tonight. Uh, Why don't you take a quick minute to introduce yourself to our audience, give us an idea of who you are, where you're from, what led you to join the Air Force, maybe some highlights of your time in the Air Force so far. Thanks, Colin. I appreciate the opportunity to hang out and chat. So big backstory. So I was running a small business while I was in high school. I did IT, essentially like if you did outsourcing of the IT servicing for other small businesses. Okay. So folks who are too small to warrant an IT person on their staff, you know, these are four and five person shops doing various industries. You know, and it was great. And I think the thing that I liked the most was you had the opportunity to help these other folks. But what kind of bothered me fundamentally about it was, you know, the only reason that you get to continue having that positive experience is that you keep the balance sheet where it needs to be at the end of the month. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think there are people who can look at that and say, oh, well, I'm not bothered by that. I understand it's just a mech, but willing to do that. My take on that was I was standing in the back of a server room that we'd set up and I got to this realization that you're just never going to change the world from the network closet, probably. Like, (laughs) (laughs) How do you end up with some, you know, impact where, and this is kind of the the thought that I've, you know, evolved over time was, you know, you're going to get to a point sooner or later and hopefully later, but there's a point where you realize perhaps that you're about done and you're about to draw your last breath. That's it. You've contributed whatever you contributed. Yeah. Hopefully it was good. Hopefully you're looking out at the world and looking at the country and saying, okay, if we're in a good spot, hey, maybe I helped in some small way, but who knows, right? Yeah. But if we're in a not so great spot, was there something I was supposed to do in this story that at a small moment in my life that I should have done better? I should have done differently. I should have done more. I don't want to live in that moment where I'm like, yeah, I know exactly where I messed it up. And here's why this led to that, led to this. And here's why DOD policy failed because, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remote is the chances. What is our duty, I think, you know, for public servants in the true sense of the word is to ensure that we have done everything on our corner of the problem, the, the, uh, the battlefield we're guarding, right? Nothing's coming through my corner. I will make sure that we've done, done better than that. So that was kind of the thought in the back of my mind that I could not seem to shake as an IT do working in North San Diego County. The Air Force and the other services 
also have guys who are working in IT closets, you know? Right. So <laughs> there was that chance that you could have come from the, you know, the private business world doing that and be brought into the military to do the exact same thing. Obviously, that didn't happen, but that could have happened, right? Yeah. I still see the purpose is different. Yeah. So but the time was, this was, I enlisted a couple of weeks, would turn out to be before 9-11. Okay. At that point, I think kind of the Air Force view of comm infrastructure and what have you, it was very commoditized. The notion that it would be operationalized into cyber offense, defense, and a number of other activities that, and this is, they'll get to a larger theme that we can talk about too, if you're interested, is this idea that we like to think traditionally and culturally about war somewhere over there. Yeah. Look what we did. We interconnect our entire planet in really, really tight and interesting ways. We interconnected our economies. We interconnected networks of flows of lots of things, primarily information, but logistics, commodities, you name it. So we did that. And then you'll have to think about war vignettes and what we can pull up one later if you want, thinking about Russian intervention in Ukraine. And there's some interesting stories there that show you that war is not over somewhere else. War is actually connected anywhere and everywhere you go. And that affects us in the RPA business as well. We'll get to that. So at that time, it was not, I think, valued the way that we value it now. Right. And so it was a right. different world picture that we we're looking at. So 9-11 comes along and I'm thinking, yeah, I made the right choice. I'm going to go get that guy with my, <laughs> my soldering iron they're going to give me in, in aircraft maintenance, right, as an electronics technician. So uh, next January, go to basic training at Lackland. Went through the various tech schools, uh, Lackland, Shepard, and then that took us to assign to Milton Hall to work for the 352nd Special Operations Group that was out there. And the whole time, so she spent working the MC-130, there's two variants of that, you know, missionized uh, Herc. Yep. And then we had the MH-53 uh, helicopter, which now retired. So two and a half years there, I got picked up to go to the academy, did that from 04 to 08, and then went to pilot training afterward at uh, NJEP, Junior NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training at uh, Shepard. Awesome. You'd think, right? And then I basically <laughs> imagine you walk this road and you're looking like your whole quest for like, why was I joining the service was this question about significance and meaning and what am I doing? Yeah. Now you've spent almost a decade training, training, training. You're probably tired of training at that point. No, that's actually a really good point. Yeah. But you just got up to the part where you're doing like the training for the job at long last, right? So, you know, I found it very difficult to be enthralled with flight itself. Okay. And it started making me think, what do I actually like? Do I like airplanes or do I like air power? And what's the difference? And so as I sat and thought about that, I've struggled through that program quite a bit. I think I got passed by grace and some commanders who were willing to give me some benefits of some doubts. I was a very inconsistent performer. I'll tell you that right there very honestly. In some areas, you know, you'd ride with uh, one person, things went really well. You're like, well, clearly you can do this. Like, what's the problem? Yeah. And then other people, I'd be absolutely intimidated by the person in the back seat because I had the wrong mentality. And from all of that, doing a great job as a guy on the flight line, turning wrenches, I wanted to make my boss happy. Yeah. The guy in the back seat does not want a T-38, does not want to be your boss. He wants you to own the aircraft. And I didn't understand exactly what he wanted me to do. So as I looked at it, I'm like, what am I doing here? <laughs> right? I'm committed to this. I'm going to do what the Air Force has sent me out to do. I'm just not sure what goes next. I don't, I don't know. Whereas most of my classmates were absolutely willing to put up with whether it was a great day or a bad day. It didn't matter as long as one more ride in the jet. Yes. Yeah. Right? And that was absolutely compelling to them. I'm like, that's not compelling to me though. Am I in the wrong place? <laughs> so, yeah. So, and this is one of those weird transitionary periods in history where there was no other road at that point that could have led to where, you know, we ultimately are at. But so I said, you know, I'm interested in, and I don't want it to, you know, sound too, uh, too crazy here, but like, I want to go do that thing. That's like engaging all the bad guys right now. Like, how do I do that? Yeah. Like you want to fly Preds. Are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> the instructor's not like, this kid's nuts. This is not what we want as an organizational culture. I really am uncomfortable with you asking that. Um, <laughs> the students thought it was awesome. They're like, oh God, he's jumping on one of the hand grenades. I don't have to step on that landmine. Right. <laughs> so that's kind of the contrast there. So really just survived through that. Went out to Creech. And now I had a totally different experience. And now we were a community that was sort of ill-defined. It was doing all kinds of things in the shadows can't talk about any of this. And some of the stuff has become public and those are the you know, things that are open source, we can refer to those. Yeah. But it was out there. And I, you know, once you, you get to a point when you're in this job where you realize the days that you weren't on shift, you felt disconnected from what was really going on in the world. Yeah. Because when you were at the job, as many hours and exhausting as it could be, you were doing everything, at least that I had set out 
the Air Force was finally letting me do. I was out using air power to go shape national security in the international environment for us. It was targeting direct threats. <laughs> and this, we were watching the most fascinating thing that happened. And we talked about some of these details later in the, the career field itself, the weapon systems, where air power is going and so forth. Yeah. But what we were doing is this is the first time air power was being used to resolve targets, as a colleague of mine said, down to the individual level of a human identity. That had not happened before. Previously, you found you resolved, oh, yes, I figured out it was a T-80 tank or I figured out it was a, you know, whatever it was or a, a platoon. I got it. Like you've identified types of targets. But you don't know who that is. Right. And this was different. This was, this person represents this threat. These are the things they've done. For the last six months, they've been trying to do the following. They try to get a bomb on this plane, right? And you just watch all this. Threat. Oh, my God. Like you have to do something about this, right? So that was a different experience. And so when I got to there, we flew the Operation Enduring Freedom, the Afghanistan lines. Yep. Uh, it was Iraqi freedom and then became a new dawn for a little while there when we closed out Iraq. And then the Libya contingency that the NATO led kicked off there as well. And so there we were suddenly in a very different theater. Yeah. So at this point, this was the bizarre reality that you realized, you start thinking about the way back to computer networks, the way networks work to compress the spatial distance between spots in our world. Just, just having this conversation. We didn't have to fly out anywhere, yeah. right? So fantastic. But we'd use networks in this very same way to project air power. And so now as you walk down the hallway of the squadron, you could go to the first door on the right that takes you to Afghanistan. And then the one after that takes you to Iraq, two more Afghanistans on the right. If you go across the hall on the left, you'll be transported to Libya, Yeah, right? It was like walking that wood between the worlds type <laughs> of place, this nexus where you could just pop out into different spots around the planet. It was fascinating, right? So... So we did that, worked in two different squadrons on the base, got a transition course to the MQ-9 with the Syracuse Guard folks, was there until 2013. And then November got sent down to Holloman to go work here at the formal training unit or FTU uh, to produce you know, more qualified air crew uh, for the community. Did that for three years and then ended up getting sent to the chief staff sponsored doctorate program. My particular one went through the Fletcher School, yeah. Tufts University, but any of these kind of top tier universities that you can get into, a bizarre setup because you're um, both trying to get telling the school that you're going to have the chief's money if they get picked and then you're telling the chief that you're getting trying to get into these schools and you're hoping the two of these things line up yep. together somewhere and you get some options and, and that works out so i did that it worked my doctorate work was essentially on understanding how we have individual biases toward some innovations over others okay this notion okay. of technological constructivism how do you build the future what assumptions are in there and if you build it how is it built radically differently than if I were to build it and or a third party would build it? So that was kind of the research to get some empirics on that. Been back here at Holloman since that point. And that's been pretty much what brought us up to today. That's awesome. That is such a jam-packed career for how many years that, up to this point? So let's see, enlisted, like I said, just before 9-11. So if you take the whole period, you don't get paid for the academy time, right? Like you're getting paid in substance <laughs> of education. <Right. laughs> so that does not count, right? No cheating on that one, but... Uh, Payment in kind. <laughs> yeah. So I think if you ask, you know, on paper, I'm 14 going on 15 year officer, you know, in the 04 pay grade. So just sort of a normal eight year group guy. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. So actually, if you don't mind, I would love to go back to the academy piece of it. Yeah. Obviously, there's a lot to unpack there, and we're going to try to do our best with the time that we have to get to these different parts of your career, especially the importance of the RPA community and what you bring to the Air Force and the, and the joint fight, right? But going back to your transition from being enlisted to being at the academy, that's something that I'm really interested in because I haven't yet interviewed anybody on this show who has that perspective of being prior enlisted and then going into doing the LEAP program and going to earn a commission at the academy. So I'm curious to hear what your experience was like, if you can remember that transition from being enlisted to being a cadet at the academy. Your experience of transition, if you're walking that road, probably depends a little bit on which kind of organizational culture and therefore like which specialty you came from. Okay, good point. So I came from aircraft maintenance. And everything, compliance is mandatory. Here's the TO. You're going to execute, put it in the technical order. It's going to tell you every single step what to do. The control and compliance results in high quality outcomes. That's what makes you succeed in maintenance. Right. That you're able to do that. And then you're able to be efficient once you get good at quality. So I show up at the academy and I'm assuming it's the Air Force. 
Well, surprise, it's not actually the Air Force. <laughs> it's the Academy. It's slightly different. They're not even wearing the right uniforms that the rest of the act duty is. What is this, right? Yeah. They have their own set of regs that, I'm going to say deviate, but they're tailored to the environment they're working in. They're contrived. They're made up. At what isn't, right? So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> good law, order, policy, et cetera, in any society, I think ultimately gets down to like, are these functional outcomes? And you can take all these different perspectives on figuring out what good policy is, but it works for them. But it was different to me. Yeah. And so I would say, you know, if, if I look back and I'm like, okay, what did I do wrong as a cadet? Like it was a tool, really, like very rules oriented. I like it really just wanted everything to fall in. I couldn't understand why 18 to 22 year olds did not find it a joy to comply with an Air Force instruction. <laughs> like, right. Like, and I was just like, of course, what are you, you stupid? Like, of course they don't. <laughs> so that was the, you know, the, I think I lacked the patience and empathy to understand that people were coming from radically different perspectives. So I had that. And then you also had, I think, a bit of the competitive pressure of realizing, you know, I'm thinking I'm some dumb guy off the flight line. Honestly, these kids are amazing. Look at all this stuff they do. And you, you read their applications. And I'm like, I just do Air Force. I don't, yeah. <laughs> what is it? They do all, they're involved in all these clubs and all. I mean, it's incredible. And so I'm like, you know, some of these people clearly got recruited for academics. Some of them clearly got recruited for athletics. Yeah. And I think it felt like, oh, I guess I'm in that quota that's recruited to like have some military presence in here. I, I don't know. <laughs> So that was where I, you know, I kind of think I didn't quite understand how do you reconcile the various gifts that you've got from walking the road in the enlisted Air Force and the heritage that you bring of bringing the enlisted experience into the place. How do you reconcile that with and understand how it fits and meshes with all the gifts that people bring from all corners of society as they're pulled into a place like that? Turns out to be a lot. Like that's challenging to try and figure out. So I don't think I did a particularly great job at that. So I did, I think, very well as a, you know, they gave you kind of in a way all the answers. There are no ambiguous challenges because I would look at homework assignments. I mean, last time, normally as an A1C or senior airman that I would see an officer was the squadron commander of the OPSO or something for a maintenance squadron. I'm checking my pockets to make sure everything's good and saluting. And that's it. That's my entire officer exposure. Yeah. So here I am sitting in a classroom and a major says, do this homework assignment. Yes, sir. Right. <laughs> yeah. It is a, it's a task that's been given out. Right. So that I, I must accomplish. It's mandatory. You can't decide whether or not to do the homework. And so that part was helpful because it brought the discipline of all tasks will be accomplished. However, <laughs> yeah. that then leads you to, hey, man, they're actually going to load you up with too many tasks on purpose in a way to get you to figure out for yourself how you prioritize. And so I just prioritize, try to do everything, which all of these various sources, school, whatever, the military said, all of them were happy because they were getting their products back on time, right? I just didn't sleep a whole lot. Yeah. And that wasn't necessarily the right answer either. <laughs> so, so I think that's kind of the challenge is if you go from this very structured work mentality, very mission-oriented you know, in that case, like I said, we were working for Air Force Special Operations, constantly deployed. The other side of the base, we'd sort of be envious that tankers would have a nice family day or whatever in you safety. And we're like, well, yeah, but that doesn't include us. No, 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 no. We're still working, guys. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's where we were. It was just go, go, go mission culture from AFSOC and from the compliance culture, I think, in maintenance. The point here is it's not if you come from maintenance, this is your road. The point is like you're going to have some culture, some more culture that you're used to. And then you're going to walk into that place and it has a different org culture. It's okay. Let it be. No, that's a really excellent point. And that's going to hold true whether you're prior enlisted like you going to the academy or you're a civilian coming off the street into ROTC or to OTS, or even once you're an officer already serving and you move to a different base, a different MAGCOM, a different squadron, you're going to bring some amount of that prior location or prior environment's culture with you. And there is going to be a little bit of a culture shock no matter where you go. And you just need to be aware of that going into it and be prepared, open-minded to learn something from that new environment and as well as be willing to share some of the things that you've learn from other locations, your background, your experience with the people that are in that new location. Yeah, absolutely. So that's something that I hope that you were able to impart to your fellow cadets there at the academy that they saw in you that military background and experience, some of that desire to take the tasks head on as they were given to you and have that become part of them as well. Because you have to have that growth mindset that you're going to absorb a little bit from everybody around you and the environment that you find yourself in. So I just hope that the other cadets that you were around saw that and those who are currently at the academy that are also being exposed to prior enlisted airmen such as yourself, that they make the very purposeful attempt to learn something from them. 
Yeah, I certainly hope that you're getting that synthesis and that blend of those, you know, cultural pieces there and that it's creating something that is more value added than if we hadn't brought that, you know, stream of diversity of thought into the picture. Yeah, and that really is one of the primary purposes of the Air Force Academy is to bring all of these disparate backgrounds and diversity of thought and knowledge and experience put it into a single location with a single purpose and get everybody to learn to work together toward that common goal of one, to graduate, two, to receive a commission, and three, get into the Air Force and start serving effectively as an officer, right? I think so. Awesome. Well, very good. Thanks for uh, explaining that for me. Now we can transition from your time at the Academy. You said you went to undergraduate pilot training, like half of your graduating class, I'm sure. That tends to be the norm for the Air Force Academy. But as you already noted, you found that flying wasn't for you. And so you found a way, you identified the thing that was really important to you. And I love that you way that you put it. You said, do I like airplanes or do I like air power? And being that self-aware is really critical to someone who is going to take control of their career and navigate within the construct and the policy that exists within the Air Force to find something that is going to mean success for you personally? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it became an interesting question because the environment had changed and the options had changed at that point when the remotely pilot, remote command and control type stuff, architectures came online. Yeah. Prior to that, it was a moot point question. It wouldn't exist. It wouldn't matter, right? Like, yeah. Hey, well, because the only meaningful way to project air power other than pure deterrence in an ICBM or something to use an airplane, that was it. Right. Then all of a sudden we had options where some command and control was done locally from the vehicle. And then some of it was done somewhere else. And then realizing like, okay, but like what draws people to each of these experiences? How much of this is about effects that you're trying to produce? How much is about fulfilling some desire for meaningful service and whatever that looks like to you? So that could lead you obviously into lots of other questions about, you know, we can talk about pilot retention. We can talk about any number of these things going on in the Air Force. But your ultimate question of why are folks, particularly in your target audience, getting involved in service? And why are they continuing to serve? And why do they stay? Yeah. Right? Is the pursuit often of meaning? There are economic incentives and inducements. Like you have to hit a certain level of competitive pay for something to be you know, workable for a family or something like that. The background factors, like they're important. They are part of that equation. But ultimately, if there's a tiebreaker there, it's what do I think is meaningful that I feel like I've done something worthwhile with life. And not everyone's going to say, hey, man, I don't necessarily put the whole meaning thing at the top. I think that's a nice to have, but... And they're going to pursue the economic incentives. That's their model. And that's their way they're approaching decision-making. Right. That's part of the challenge, particularly with the air crew retention stuff that we've dealt with for the past few years, is that there is no one model for retaining air crew because there's all these different models of different people. Yeah. We don't have a great exact mapping of how people do it. And honestly, it's all a personal question at some point. So, right. So it's very tough for an institution that has to live on numbers, codes, spreadsheets, all of that type of hard data to make decisions to try and get after a very fuzzy challenge. So yeah, the human element is very difficult to get after. But the hope is here, especially with General Brown and Chief Bass and their desire to accelerate change or lose, they're recognizing that we have to address that human element a little bit more head on in order to retain the talent that we need in order to remain relevant and capable in projecting power, being effective in joint operations, and keeping our near-peer adversaries at bay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So while you were at undergraduate pilot training, you recognized that there was an option for you to go a different direction, which led to you joining the RPA, Remotely Piloted Aircraft Community, as a pilot. And now we can talk a little bit more about that career field specifically. So... Let's turn it over to you there to explain what is RPA, what is the community that goes with it, what is your AFSC or AFSCs, as I have now learned that there are multiple. Help our audience understand a little bit more about broad strokes of what it means to be part of the RPA community. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, you could, there are plenty of pieces of history that you can go back to pull out how in the world did we formulate this group of people, right? Yeah. Um, This is sort of the ragtag fleet on the run for survival out there doing national security missions of the utmost importance. So it is a very interesting experience in human history. A lot of it will 
not be declassified anytime in the next four decades. <laughs> a lot more of that will essentially have its declassification date renewed till the end of time, as long as there's a U.S. government to continue to sign that, right? So right. Uh, there's a lot going on there and pieces that we, we can say. We can talk about the human experience. We can talk about what is it like and how is the community. And those are like, what's the job like? You know, that type of stuff. So background, if you wanted things like a gentleman who's now Brigadier General, Houston Cantwell wrote an interesting SAS thesis paper called Beyond Butterflies. And he was talking about like the butterfly effect, right? Yeah. Uh, not like the literal flapping of the organism, right? So what he was writing was he's captured a lot of primary source pieces about the history of this enterprise. And then if you want a book that, you know, for anyone who's worked in a, a secured environment, you, you know, check your pockets, make sure you haven't taken out anything you shouldn't, you're not bringing in anything you shouldn't. Yeah. And you have that like panic check of, oh, I didn't do anything wrong here, right? <laughs> so you're, you're, <laughs> that kind of feeling, you want that feeling when you're sitting at home in your living room, reading a, a book, go read Rich Whittle's Predator, Secret Origins of the Drone Revolution. Okay. So <laughs> that will give you a lot that's, uh, you know, that's, that's out there that I think rates fascinating human story about what was going on. And obviously these are all the, the things that are open source and, and available to, to understand. But the reality is we have not really done an effective job often of connecting with the public and explaining what's going on and how it's going on. The messages that we did get, we let's see, we had in 2010, a 60 minutes interview from the community. Um, so there were some of the leaders that were involved in that. And then we had some other little bits of uh, Air Force PA engaged, but mostly what did they tell the public? These people who worked to death in a salt mine called Creech Air Force Base. <laughs> The Air Force is clearly like overwhelmed if it's trying. We don't actually know if it's trying or not, but it says it's trying. So we'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but it's clearly not, you know, progressing there. They're just getting more and more overworked. And we've got people, you know, captains, majors, and lieutenant colonels who have to sleep during the day, put a mattress in their walk-in closet so that their kids don't keep up. And you're like, wow, this is sad, right? <laughs> and so the unfortunate part is, is why, you know, why we're like sitting there going, okay, well, th these things are true, but it's giving this very incomplete picture of what's going on. So the piece we talked about on org cultures, the culture of this community is about the most diverse and rich in thought and approaches to air power that you could ever have. Yeah. Because we pulled people from everywhere. So, so we have people who came originally from the fighter enterprise. We have folks that came out of bombers. We have folks from transport mobility, airlift, air refueling of every variety. And you've got a whole new generation of people in this 18 X career field. So 18 alpha for attack, 18 R for reconnaissance, and then 18 S for special operations. Those folks are the ones who went through a new undergraduate RPA training. So now a peer with undergraduate pilot training, undergraduate navigator training. Now you've got undergraduate RPA training. And that is a pipeline that's focused on how do you produce this type of human capital? Yeah. The people who do this, who work in this culture and thrive. And it's different. Every weapon system has certain properties of it that to really exploit them correctly for what that thing is designed to do. There's going to be a certain you know, list of characteristics of what does the best look like. Well, the person who flies C-17 is the best. That exact mentality, unless they change it, right? And it could be the same person that could adapt it, right? But, yeah. but if they tried to take copy that template and go over to the F-16, it's going to be a disaster, right? Right. You just, you're not graded on the things in an F-16 that you're graded on in a C-17. So that's not how this works. So same story. There's a different org culture because of the properties of the weapon system. So what's the culture that we've amalgamated <laughs> together here? It's actually really flexible, a really fungible one. And it's constantly in, I mean, like this is a weapon system that gets software upgrades, I think every six months or something. And it radically changes some of the capabilities. And this is a, you know, a system that group people who work for all kinds of combatant commands all over the world, right? And there's all kinds of stuff going on with the thing. It grew up in this counter-terror counterinsurgency or CT coin environment. Yeah. We got kind of comfortable, to be honest with that. And then now as the national defense strategy picture is changing, now the question is, how do you deal with great power competition? Well, go read the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessment or CSBA's paper, Deterrence by Detection. What are we starting to distill? What is it that we produce? We produce persistent air power and it's persistent attack and reconnaissance are the things that we really, really do well. And so you start realizing if you want to look at a strategic game, how are we playing against Beijing, Moscow, any other third party, you take your pick. And these competitions, I think, can be had as civilly as possible, even if armed forces are involved in them. Yeah. Countries can manage conflict well, or they can manage it poorly while meeting their objectives. And they might even go to a draw, except that they fought the contest fairly reasonably and civilly. And hopefully that buys them time to work out you know, other resolutions. 
So if you're dealing with a revisionist power that likes to tweak and adjust below the threshold of conflict, it's not quite a war. You can't call this a war. It's just a small action. Yeah. It's just a mercenary, right? So all of those things that kind of gray zone concept that people talk about and whatever you think of, of gray zone as an academic concept, but that notion of something short of what we would formally recognize as war. What happens if now there's US air power, whether it is under a US flag, a NATO flag, a UN observer, I don't know, it doesn't matter. What if that feed now can be beamed to CNN whenever we want to? Or what if it could be back channeled to that country's leader saying, I saw what you did there. Yeah. Do you want that on CNN or no? Okay, you might want to withdraw. Just saying, have you not solved the conflict? You've used persistence in a way that shaped the strategic narrative. So what is persistent air power? It's the least decisive and yet could be the you know, moments we don't know could be the most decisive thing we do. But it doesn't share the same theory of operation that most of what air power was built on, which was to get to the centers of gravity and decisively strike the enemy targets, cripple the enemy system. We do that in counterterror by finding which leaders you want to take out and when and where. Like, so there's a piece of that, like the same targeting theory that the Air Force always had entered into the counterterror world. But when you start bringing this persistent power back, now it's about blocking actions. Now it's about changing the game and the rules of the game in very interesting ways. Yeah. Ultimately, I start realizing like, what is this weapon system? I don't know. It sits for 20, 40. Some of these newer ones being built out maybe are arguing for 60 hours. The manufacturers claim anyway. If we'll see if that actually happens, right? <laughs> when they get uh, you know, built. But they're ultimately looking at what can I do if I can correct the Achilles heel of air power? And I would say the Achilles heel of air power is its requirement to continuously expend energy to do the thing it's supposed to do. Yeah. You can't create your effects unless you keep spending gas or something, like some form of energy. Well, if instead of, you know, like you'll watch, like we talk about problems in the Pacific. Okay, we have a range problem. We have relatively short range fighters coming off the line. Now we have tanker problems and we have basing problems. So one ingenious solution that you'll see Paco Benitez over on War on the Rocks, it's a fascinating paper talking about refueling in very agile ways and then they're very non-conventional. We're like, cool, you want to solve the supply problem and keep the fighters. Well, we want to solve the demand problem by putting up airplanes that carry lots of those weapons, but don't require nearly as much gas. Yeah. Totally different theory to solve the same problem. So now you start to realize, like, what is it like to be in this community? You are constantly trying to show the Air Force a value proposition that it's ingrained culture all the way up to the headquarters does not want to hear over and over and over again. So this leaves you a little bit as, as a threatened community. And what do threatened communities do? Like every other one in, in Air Force history, they form mafias. Right? That's right. <laughs> so there's a bomber mafia, there's a fighter mafia, well, there's a reaper mafia, right? And it's how do I, and really they're not out doing something criminal as a literal mafia would, of course, right? But what they're doing is, hey, how do I have to informally network with my peers in different ways? There are people in this community who do things for the good of the community, even though it's personally costly over and over again. And you're like, why are you so, it's not in your interest personally. And they're like, it doesn't matter. It's for the enterprise for the enterprise, it's for the community. And there's a lot of that that goes on. So that is probably the most, I think, interesting part is watching a group of people who are in a way where though the technology is radically different, they are adopting very similar human behaviors to the pioneers in the 1920s. Yeah. Just like the Air Corps Tactical School and all these folks. Like, so why would somebody come out and join this career field? Yep, you're going to make a difference. Yep, you're going to employ weapons in combat in a very short period of time. I think the record is six minutes after we certified a lieutenant. Evaluator walked out, walked into the op cell, looked up at the feeds and saw the, the picture explode, right? And like, what just happened? Like, oh, well, that line just struck. Well, I could just certify that guy six minutes ago, right? So, <laughs> so yes, you're going to do all those things. And yes, I would tell you, I spent 2,500 hours of this thing, ones and nines. And I sat next to often 18 to, to 25 year old or so airmen. And I had the opportunity for all the good stuff of leadership, the informal influence, the mentoring, the listening, to hear what's going on in their lives, to build, you know, trust-based relationships. Yeah. All the good stuff. I signed zero performance reports. <laughs> the biggest scam gig you could ever have as a CGO. It's awesome. Right? <laughs> so, if you love the leadership and the opportunity to make a positive impact in people's lives. So you're going to have an impact on mission. You're going to have an impact on people. But you're also going to be a part of a group of people who are absolutely comfortable being a ragtag group of renegades for air power. And that is not what you're going to get in any other community. And that is not to belittle any other community's contribution. They're doing the things they're supposed to be doing. Right. They're doing it the way they've evolved stable cultures for reasons. We're the unstable culture that is adaptable. You send us a different piece of hardware, like, okay, 
hey, we want you to fire this weapon in combat. It's it's been tested once by Raytheon. Okay. Right. <laughs> the willingness to do, you know, all kinds of uh, crazy exploits. I'm just making up, you know, I've said examples, but but they're all of the willingness to adapt and embrace change in the hardware, the software, the procedures, the tactics, it evolves rapidly out here. So I think if you're looking for a moving target, kind of a challenge, then this is a great place. If that's not what you want, you just want to fly airplanes, you should probably do something else. Like there's a, and we've got no shortage of need in the Air Force to fill those roles too. So again, back to your original point of self-awareness, what do you want? Where do you feel called to make a difference? Yeah. Or whatever that is, go do that and do it with gusto and make that impact that you've got in mind there. Yeah. I mean, I'm sold. I think that what you all are doing in the RPA community is absolutely fantastic. My personal opinion is that it's the future of not only air power, but space power that the ability to remove the risk that is presented by putting a human in the jet, in the air, or in space is something that has been proven out here that we can avoid and still deliver the same effect or even greater effect on behalf of combatant commanders, on behalf of the United States, carrying out those and achieving those national strategic objectives. I think what the RPA community is demonstrating is showing us to right now is what the future can and should look like. But that's my personal opinion. And also one from someone who's completely outside of the community, having nothing to do with it. But that's my personal assessment. You brought up two interesting points in there. One of them was risk reduction. And then the other one was essential equivalency with, let's say, something else that the Combat Air Force of the CAF is bringing. Yeah. So we would quickly note that we don't believe that we provide the same effect that an f e Strike Eagle provides rolling into combat. Okay. That thing has no interest, like us, it has no interest in being stealthy. It has got a greater cross-section of a barn door and let the world be, know that it's coming for you, right? Right. It brings just massive amounts of firepower. So what we found was, instead of trying to compare whose value proposition is cooler than whose, <laughs> and this, this is a central theory you'll see that really drives the Air Force's weapons school out at Nellis. Okay. It is this idea of tactical integration. How is the whole greater than the sum of each of the parts? Right. And so I'm not interested in competing with what, my bros in the F-16 do. I'm not at all. I'm not trying to do that. But clearly, the shape of the platform should tell you this. <laughs> These are very aerodynamically different. They are not built to do the same thing. Right. The question is, what happens when I merge their capabilities and link them together? So that part that General Goldfein had talked about, stop thinking about the truck, think about the highway and how, they're, you know, like how is everything interconnected? That's what matters. How are we networking? What we're doing with the advanced battle management system or the JAD C2, like all those, it's all about networking these. So seeing air power as nodes in a network and airplanes all at the same time is a very interesting dualistic view. So that's the part we'd say about essential equivalency. The second part is on risk, really. We didn't actually take people out of the cockpit to reduce the risk. Everyone thinks that. Like, it's the first natural, like, oh, great. And so uh, we didn't, you know, really ob- object or say anything as that public narrative sort of settled on that, but that wasn't really what we were doing. Yeah. What's the cost per year to sustain one deployed member in Afghanistan or wherever, right? I have no idea. <laughs> so DOD figures will give you 100,000 plus or whatever. The point is, it's a huge amount of dollars in sustainment. And then those logistical trains get bigger and bigger. Yeah. They become more brittle, more vulnerable. If a country decides they don't want to let you through anymore because of a treaty issue right. or a whatever's going on in international politics, now you have a problem sustaining force. So what we did with persistence was ultimately to sustain the projection of military power at relatively affordable costs. Yeah. Because we had an enemy whose strategy was protracted warfare. It was, I'll wait a century, but I'll make you spend yourself stupid. Yep. I'll make you wear yourself down. And we said, nope, I know what you're doing. You grabbed a butt page out of the book of T.E. Lawrence and Mao Zedong, and you think you're going to do global insurgency. Well, one of the things you have to have to get an effective insurgency in those theories is an unassailable base, a place in the wilderness you can go run off to. Well, we just put air power all over the place all the time. That's what persistence is all for, right? Yeah. And not just any persistence, not just a sensor, lethal persistence. So now there was literally nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. Terrifying, right? I don't want to be on the other end of that. Right. But it meant that you could not effectively run an insurgency if you were trying to follow 120-year-old doctrine. It just wouldn't work anymore. Yeah. That's why we did that. The risk piece, I don't know. But as you talked about the space part, think about what does it cost then in logistics weight, just fuel everything to sustain presence in space. And even if you have a human presence in space, and that's desirable for lots of social reasons, and for the human achievement piece of it and the experience of it, yeah. Great, let's do all that. But aren't you going to want to also extend those people's capabilities to do lots more that they don't have to be all the places all the time? 
they probably want to cover a lot of geography. Well, I don't know if space geography makes sense as a term, right? <laughs> yeah. The idea that they're going to want to cover lots of operating locations that are of interest to them. And if people are looking for details on that, I would say Everett Dolman's Astropolitik, fantastic uh, book, understanding the quote unquote terrain of space in the near Earth environment. Yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying that for me. Obviously, speaking from the uninitiated side of things, but how nice that it is to have that byproduct of the risk reduction while pursuing the ability to have persistent air power and the cost reduction that's associated with it. So having that much better understanding of the RPA community, why RPA itself exists, you know, for the point of presenting persistent air power as something that can be integrated into the rest of the Air Force inventory. What I want to understand now is why have an officer be involved in the piloting, the operating of the aircraft itself? Why does it need to be an officer? Why does the 11U or 18X or whatever the AFSC is, why have that? You know, Senator Joe Manchin was in a subcommittee hearing with the two most senior you know, in our case, Air Combat Command and your equivalent, uh, his counterpart in uh, the Army. And he said, he asked the same question. He's like, one of you has these kinds of systems. And first of all, kinds of systems was sort of a loose umbrella, right? But they're both built by General Atomics, ASI. So, so, all right, fair enough. So you, Air Force, have an officer flying it. And you, Army, appear to have enlisted soldier flying it. I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. And so here's what, the, what we talked about earlier. We said we mentioned command and control. And we're so terrible in the DoD in our acronym soup yeah. that we like to just say C2 all day. And we say them as if they're one thing, but they're not. They're two distinct concepts. So what the Air Force ultimately does that makes it difficult for the outside world and for Congress and for everybody else who's got to sit there and evaluate policy to understand. Pilot has two meanings that are overloaded. The first meaning is equipment operator. And everybody got that part. Yep, you move the stick, the plane goes, right? I got it. So the second part, though, was aircraft commander. Every major weapon system in the DoD inventory has an aircraft commander. So you want to know the real truth of the Army model for the, the Gray Eagle Sky Warrior program? There's an enlisted soldier piloting it or operating it. There is a, another one, sensor operating, so driving the payloads. Yeah. And supervising them as a 15W traditional Army aviation officer. So actually, the manpower model is three to two Army to Air Force in that view. Now, how many different lines of combat, how many different cockpits does the 15W? I haven't gotten a chance to sit and chat with them. The last time I got a good you know, opportunity to sit was we were both deployed in a forward location and they were parked right next to us in the ramp. So we got to kind of walk around the facility and see like, hey, how do you do this? And this was all kinds of fun. But there's this also think about the Army model is organic air power mm-hmm. integrated in the maneuver scheme of the larger unit. Air Force is theater air power. So as strange as it sounds, you're like, why do I need the alone and unafraid model of the aircraft commander in the aircraft when I've got this opportunity to go through the network and I've got this central hub of a squadron in the States or wherever? Why do I need an aircraft commander there? So there's a couple layers to this. So what has been up to this point? Ultimately, like if I have two battles going on in Syria, 20 miles apart, it's only 20 miles, but you're looking at the dynamics of each fight totally differently. Yeah. Uh, legal considerations, ethical considerations, weaponeering considerations, geometry. Okay, if I want the missile flying at a 75 degree impact angle and I need it to come from a heading of 090, whatever, like you have to work through all of that. Yep. Can you do two battle spaces at once? Do you have a cognitive skill we've developed to teach you how to do that? And the answer was no. So I'm like, okay, but you're about to employ lethal force. So who's taking authority for this in this distributed theater air power model? Oh, I need an aircraft commander per engagement. So we start to realize it's fractional. Like there's times where if everything's going normal, they're all just transiting from point A to point B. You probably could have one person just supervise everything. And we tried that with something called the MAX. It was a multi-aircraft control system. Unfortunately, like it ended up being just this little, we call it keyboard video mouse or KVM switch. You press the button, it switches computers, right? Like it would switch racks for which aircraft you were controlling. Yeah. So the problem is then, okay, everything's going fine. And we said it was going to be normal. Well, what happens when two of them have emergencies? Yeah. If you, and this is the deal, so think about the oath that you actually swore. This brings you back, I think, to your core area here is in, in this podcast. I've had both of these oaths. I'm the same human being. I had an enlisted oath that said I would sworn to obey the orders of, of the officers appointed by me and the President of the United States. Right. And then I took an officer oath and it didn't say that at all. On purpose, it didn't say that. It gave me a lot more ambiguity to take a command decision. And so if I'm the aircraft commander, I have the legal latitude and I have the 
in everything from legality to ethics to how I'm being given authority matches the task. I need to make a call and I need to be able to do it now to respond to a situation that's developing because I've got about 30 seconds before they're going to be too close into town and you're not going to be able to take the shot. And if they get into that town, what's going to happen to those people is awful. So I want that decision-making authority that is backed up by law right to the edge. Now I want you to think about the future. That's how it was. People look at what they see and they try to evaluate it and analyze it. They go from the known to the unknown. It's natural. But what happened when I split the cockpit from the air vehicle? Well, now it's a rack of computers. Okay. Do you imagine that I could miniaturize that to maybe a laptop? Okay. What if instead of, a, you know, I've got the laptop and now does it have to be in a shipping container on the ground or in a building, an operations building on the ground? What if you're in the back of some mobility asset? In the back of the C-17, it's been modified and I'm using some mesh network radios. So I'm not using satellites. So you can't jam my satellites or blow up my satellites. It doesn't matter. I've got some type of other way, whatever it is, to get to these airplanes. And now I'd start to ask questions like, where's all the sci-fi interfaces that are cool? Like, why can't I just talk to Jervis or whatever? Like, why can't I just get it to do natural language speech processing? Yeah. Why can't I specify intent? And you start realizing that people, ooh, and even in this community, they're like, oh, are we going to lose our core identity is I'm the pilot. I'm the guy who moves the stick. Yeah. And sensor operators are like, well, if there's automatic target recognition and it knows from bajillion D hours of video processing that it knows how to identify all the targets and it moves the pod faster than I can and it, it does all this amazing stuff. It puts the targets on like, oh, wonderful. All these great ideas that are out there. And they're like, well, well sir, what do I do, right? You're right. And they're wondering, are they going to be victims of what Darren Asimoglu, a MIT professor said, was skill bias technical change. The job is changing in a way that your skills, your human capital has now been sort of displaced by something automated. Yep. I said, look, none of the above. So what's going to happen here is this is the one community, I remember I said, has a flexible, adaptable organizational culture. Unlike other communities, not to say they don't have adaptability, but not to this insane extent. I'll just put it that way, right? So people who are willing to be reinvented, like who else was I going to pick to have a partnership with machines that have increasingly sophisticated cognitive computing on board? who were willing to see these in different terms than anybody else was willing to see them. It, <laughs> start to think about like, where does this go? Well, I need you to be the commander and some of your people you know, in, in the formation responding to you are absolutely other human beings who can give you human-like help. And some of these are some very sophisticated machines, but you need to understand their limitations. They're just machines. But they can do some amazing things. I need you to command this package. I need you to command this mission. I need you to use these resources to bring about the combatant commander's intent. That's what I need to happen. Yeah. Okay. I can't automate that. Hey, sensor operator, I need you to manage 16 airplane sensor platforms right now. And I want a coherent collection plan. Here are my objectives. Ready, go. Okay. Yeah, I can't automate that because it's all that context and intent. And is there some world where maybe you've solved some of these problems? I don't know. Maybe. But anywhere near today, I shouldn't plan on that if I'm doing you know, the fight up, I'm doing defense budgeting. I should plan for what are my humans good at? What are my machines good at? How do I pair them together? And is the answer to try and turn all the robots into loyal wingmen? I don't think so. I think it's to turn them into a very sophisticated mesh of local and remote command and control. And that officer piece you're talking about is why? Because I need commanders who can be placed flexibly throughout the battle space, whether that is over the Pacific, back in the States, on orbit. I don't care, right? Like yeah. wherever you put them, there's a human being who could stand tall and take accountability and say, General, I did the following, trying to meet your intent. Here's what I did right. This is what I know I messed up. And I own this. Okay. By the way, then comes the feedback. Like, here's what else you messed up that you didn't even understand. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I need a human being who can be held accountable and who can grow from that experience and then turn that into more combat capability, more thinking, more strategy. I need the things that humans do. And the officer career path development enables us to build that kind of human capital. By the way, like the barriers between once upon a time, I think there was a huge O versus E split and almost as a class system, maybe a hundred years ago. That's not the world we live in. Yeah. And as a prior enlisted guy, I can tell you that's absolutely true. We have Air Force A1, the first off folks have done an amazing job opening up the cross flow from the sensor side, particularly to recruit them to say, do you want to get in the left seat? If you're done with your bachelor's. And some said, yeah, I would like to do that. Other people are like, no, I want to go do something else with my life. That's fine. Yeah. Right. But the opportunity is the door was open and they start realizing oh, we've now got a handful of them. We're like, I remember you've got like 2000 hours as a sensor operator. Right? And now you're like, yeah, but I'm a second lieutenant now. So this is kind of weird. Like, 
Yeah, but you're actually really a lot older than the average second yeah. lieutenant. So I'm going to work your training program like this. Is that okay? Like, Absolutely, sir. Like, perfect. So that's where we're at is this very interesting mix. And that's why. That's how we do command and that's how we do authority. I love that so much. The recognition that the machine is just that. It's a machine, a very capable, very powerful, very effective machine. And that machine comes with an enlisted sensor operator who is every bit as capable as well and is helping to provide those effects. And so is the pilot too, in that you know they're driving the stick, but obviously the machine has some capability on board for it to override human error or to expand upon what the human is able to do. But the machine is not a commander. And that's the thing. So I would give people, when we talk about this in some summits, these topics that come up, and I said, you know, you can and probably should automate control to military advantage to give you flexible options. Yeah. You cannot, and you should never, ever try to automate command because command is about authority, responsibility, and capability being aligned in some way that creates meaningful outcomes for society. That is the doing what your society who pays the bills to have a Department of Defense was expected to go out and do, do we do those things? And if you've done command well, you will achieve those things. Yes, at the minimum loss of life. Yes, at the minimum expenditure of national treasure. Um, but ultimately, you'll do them in a principled way that is very hard to capture. How am I supposed to give a machine a full ethics matrix that represents all that? And even if I could, does anyone really feel okay holding the software accountable? Like, oh, I don't know. I'm going to threaten to delete it if it doesn't behave. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't. It falls so flat, right? Like that doesn't mean anything to us. So yeah, so I would tell you that you know the other key idea behind that is honestly from the tactical through the strategic and all like conflict is ultimately between humans. Conflict is ultimately won or lost by ideas being better than the other ideas. So the tactician, you think about what is the value that the pilot provides? You know, like what is that track that we push people to tactical excellence for? It's because when they start realizing, like, I see the situation, I've got this idea. Like, hey, we're gonna. And it might sound simple, like, I'm just going to fly here, do this. I'm going to call the other asset and say, hey, with the strike, eagle, do the following. Cool. Got it. Meanwhile, here's what I'm planning. Like, cool. And that's what a tactical lead basically set up some scenario and he executed. And all the players across with, you know, what platform they were coming from, whether they're talking on radios or they're using data links to communicate data packets back and forth to each other. Ultimately, he had an idea about how to win this particular battle in this one spot on earth at this one moment in time. Yeah all the way up through, hey, I had this idea about what would cause our enemies to understand the cost impositions we could create if they don't start getting more diplomatic like we'd like them to. Yeah. That's an idea. And that's what we're producing is thinkers who can actually execute and translate intent for what our nation's values and what our society exists to be. How can I translate that into the world in a respectable and honorable way? Yeah. And not only producing thinkers, but producing commanders who can carry out that thought and make the necessary decisions to ensure its success or be accountable for when it doesn't go properly. Absolutely. Yeah. I, oh, I love that so much. And I just want to say it again. Maybe we should probably automate the control aspect of what the RPA community and maybe the bigger Air Force as well. But we should never automate command. Correct. Because of the commission because of the special trust and confidence that is placed on us as officers in the Air Force, our authority that is derived from the Constitution, and that responsibility that we have to the American people, it necessitates that we maintain that command and never give it to the machine or some other entity. Yeah, think about, yeah, is that machine entity ever on parity with you? If one day you decide... The Android is so human, like I can't tell the difference anymore. That is a decision for that society yeah. in that yeah. era to figure out what that means to them, to the society we live in and serve. That is not a decision the people have made that they think that's essentially equivalent. And because that that's the case, that's the parameters in which we have to live and operate. And I think for us, it makes a lot of sense. So, you know, I don't worry about the hypothetical future and what is, oh my God, the robots are taking our job. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> are you kidding? We're the only people who can handle the robots and understand what they are for what they are. Yeah. The example I would give you is once upon a time, a couple of colleagues and I were chatting about this this past week. Once upon a time, we rode into war on war horses that were in fact a horse. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> a locating creature. And just like, this is strange enough, like training humans, you understood there was variation in all of them. And so, but you're like, yeah, but I train the horses to basically perform within, you know, some kind of range of ex- expectations. Yeah. But you knew each one had a little different personality. Okay. So then we mechanized and we standardized and industrialized and we produced and all of it turned into the new war horse could go places the old four-legged one could never even dreamed of at crazy altitudes into space, you name it, right? Yeah. We did all kinds of horses that we built here, <laughs> but they're all mechanized. Other than manufacturing tolerances, they're all the same. It's an inventory quantity. And that's how we start to do a net assessment on opponents, capabilities, how much quantity of this thing do they have, all that. But what happens when you get to the realization that one of the most powerful things you could do with using machine learning to evolve different solutions out of different data sets that you train it on is to create almost like a pollinated garden, essentially to have a lot of variety so that when you know the blight comes along that kills your favorite strain of tomato, you've actually got some tomatoes that know how to survive it. So you actually want to build variety into these. So now I'm no longer building robots that are exactly identical. Then this is the part of, I think would confuse or blow people's minds. Like what happens if at some point in the future, they all have personalities. You're like, what do you mean personalities? Like, no, literally each one of them was built off of a different data training set, even with the same starting points. Yeah. And they kind of approach these tactical problems differently. They're all valid. They're just different. It's like people. You train them to, hey, you need to do the following. But they bring their own flavor to it. And doing that essentially gives you some options that we've never explored. And I don't think anyone's really explored at this point. So there's a, a world in the future going out there. And as I'm trying to figure out, okay, who's going to handle the robots, right? Probably the people who are handling robots now. Yeah. Even these are a little bit more primitive, you know, by contrast to that kind of vignette. Yeah. Well, and the hope is that as our ability to create new robots or machines or any sort of object thing with whatever capabilities, that we continue to also innovate on our ability to command those things and other people, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we cannot be static in continuing to develop as officers and exercising and developing that ability to provide command. I think it really reinforces your point, if you want, from the literature. There's a book called Our Robots Ourselves by Professor David Mendel at MIT. He's on a sabbatical doing a private enterprise at the moment, last I checked, but it's very easy to read, very consumable. I think you don't have to be like a specialist in anything MIT-like yeah. to really get a lot of value out of this one. But what he had said on this thing was, he said, you know, you want to understand these complex ensembles where humans and robots and everything are involved and there's automation. And he asked you a question like, what is autonomy? Do you even have autonomy? Do I? I don't know. I'm constrained by a whole lot of things. So I'm not sure I'm particularly autonomous. Right. I got a work schedule I live on. Right. right. So he said, you know, so when you get past that and you're realizing like, where do you need to look in the, these systems? He said, follow the humans. Where are the humans? What humans are they? What are they doing? You know, when and how? And ultimately that view sees all technologies as these expressions of human agency. The things that get built were built because we thought they were good ideas. Yeah. Somebody else thinks something else is a good idea. They're going to build different tech. So if he's looking at that, like, look, man, you look at that sophisticated, oh my gosh, cool robot with all of these billions of lines of code or whatever, right? And you've got all these neural network things going on and there's all kinds of neat stuff going on there. Yeah. Cool. Do you not have any idea how many millions of assumptions by the developers are built into its design? Humans can't get their fingerprints off the things they build. And so this ultimately traces back to, look, you have to be responsible for what you created. Yeah. And so that brings you back to this notion of command when you're employing things in a deadly endeavor like combat. You have to be responsible for this. And that's what we deal with that question in the DoD with the notion of command and all that that entails. Yeah, I love it. And I think that's a great place to leave that piece of it. And you know, there's so much more that I would love to dive into about the being an RPA pilot, being an officer in that community, being involved in in combat operations and the day in the life and all that. I think what we're going to have to do, though, is just uh, pause there and bring you back another time because we barely scratched the surface on so much that deals with this particular aspect of air power and how we as officers employ it on behalf of the Air Force, right? So just leaving the open invitation there for you to come back and share a little bit more uh, with our audience about what it's like, you know, day in the life of an RPA pilot or uh, aircraft operator in that regard. Well, if I don't get fired after the first one, then I'll let you know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So there's uh, two more questions here that I would like to bring to you. 
The first one is if somebody can't wait for that episode to come out, if they want to start picking your brain about being in the RPA community, if they want to be an RPA pilot, if they want to get involved, learn more, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? I mean, I don't know if you want us to want to be in the business of filtering connections here, but you're certainly welcome to absolutely happy to do it. To refer folks to some story when we you know push articles out and some other authors to say, I'd like to talk to this author about this part of their paper or whatever. The editors typically will forward them on. Yep. So I'm absolutely happy to answer those things as best I can. Yeah. So we'll just have our audience reach out to us directly to our Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com address. And if they want to get in touch with you, we can forward that on to you. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Then our last question here for you, Mike, is what does it mean to be an officer? So ultimately, and having served in both capacities as an airman, on the enlisted side, and then an airman with a commission on the officer side. So at some point, I think if I had to simplify it, and I want to be careful with the language that it's not too connotation loaded, but at some point, it's uh, like you become a partner or an owner in the organization. There's no point where, look, I've done all my stuff and it's outside my scope. So look, I'm doing my function and then I have the right to go. And my you know, NCO supervisors, as I was in you know, an airman, like, look, no, 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 this is what we expect you to do and do it well. And please be back here at seven o'clock tomorrow, ready to do it again. Like, okay. And whatever problems are above that, I could leave it to the NCOs. And they took it to the officers, right? And at some point, you're like, well, who ends up getting stuck up till two o'clock in the morning fixing things? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right? So at some point, you're like, all of this is our problem, whatever those challenges are. And ultimately, like as you brought this notion of command up, like what are we training people to? Kind of those pinnacle experiences in the officer career. Uh, command. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Is the is the opportunity and the privilege to lead America's best and brightest truly into some of the most dangerous endeavors in the world. And the question that I think most commanders would look at when they're looking, do I want to hire this person for command? Do I want to put them in charge of something? Is do I trust you with my airmen? If I do, this is easy. And if I don't, well, this is probably not going to work out, right? So yeah. So the essence of it, you know, there's no stopping short of that. There's no point where like, well, I kind of almost earned trust. What? Right? It, there's no such world. And so if you're on this road, whether or not you intend to specifically be a squadron commander, sit or whatever in that type of role, the same underlying idea is always true. Are you behaving in a way that says that you will take charge over the problems that are presented? Will you do all of the right things, even though this is so far outside of a reasonable expectation, it doesn't matter. You deal with it, right? Yeah. Whatever benefits the airmen that you're leading, whether that is the fun stuff of congratulating them and taking the time out to when good stuff happens, or if it's the really uncovered part where you're like, hey, you totally don't want to hear this, but, and now you're going to totally associate me with negative things and I feel horrible about that, but you need this feedback in order to grow for where you need to go next and to be the best person you could ever be. So that tends to be kind of the, I think the philosophy that has made sense to me was really, if you are on this road where you want to inspire trust, inspire growth and inspire change, you're in the right business pursuing commission. If that sounds like totally uninteresting, well, uh, you, know, you may want to reevaluate like why am I involved in this, right? But I think that's one of those things that I would hope that's an appealing vision for people is you're making a positive impact on the lives around you in some of the most substantively important endeavors in the human experience. I love it. Very well said. Thank you, Major Mike Burns. This has been a real pleasure having you here to talk about the importance of the RPA community, the importance of being an officer in that community, and just the big principles of officership in general. It's been great learning from you. Like I said, we're going to have to bring you back because there's so much more that we dig into here about the future of air power and how RPA is going to play a role in that. So with that, we'll leave it there and say until next time, right? <laughs> My pleasure. First of all, thanks to Mike for taking the time to have this conversation and outlining so much of what's going on with the RPA. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. But he is so smart and so articulate and so capable in explaining what's going on within the RPA community that I felt like my brain was two ounces compared to his 50 pound brain. You know, that kind of happens when you're talking to someone with a PhD in the topic. Yeah, it, 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 that happens. Yeah. And here is the funniest thing that happened after the interview. He, he talked about introducing me to the smartest person that he knows. And I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know that I would even be able to say something intelligible to a, somebody like that. But OK, let's let's see where this goes in the future, maybe. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, I totally agree. This person's ability to speak about air and air power uh, was pretty darn impressive. Yeah, he is a brilliant mind and obviously a great benefit to not just the RPA community, but to the officer corps and the Air Force as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. And just to start off, you know, he said it very early on in the interview, and I want to highlight it again here. I had never heard it put this particular way, and it just really floored me. The question, do I like airplanes or do I like air power? That is such a fascinating phrase to me that I would love to have a little discussion with you, Reed, about with respect to our profession being members of the military and not being flyers, but involved in the business of the application of air power. And that being kind of like the foundation of this podcast is exploring the training and development of leaders in the application of air power, right? That's what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. And I can identify so well with this phrase because, yeah, I think airplanes are cool, but I never wanted to fly one. I was never really interested in that. But I think air power is awesome. Yeah, I, I think about how many people aren't flying planes. And then I ask the question, but do we love air power? Yeah, that, that phrase, Colin, really gave me a lot to think about. And it has some additional questions that go along with it that I think everybody who's listening to this, especially those who want to go fly, not that there's anything wrong with that, but they need to ask themselves, do you like the airplane, the idea of wearing the zipper suit and flying around with your hair on fire? Or do you like the idea of employing air power on behalf of the American people and striving to accomplish the objectives of the United States? Where do you fall on that? And you need to be able to answer that question if you're truly going to be successful as an officer. Yeah, just a really good perspective. And talk about being self-aware and, you know, understanding what was important to him. I mean, those were things he was deciding really early. Yeah, it did help that he had spent some time enlisted. And so he had been around air power as a aviation electronics technician. So he had spent some time thinking about that before he ever showed up to NGEPT and undergraduate pilot training. But I think it's a question that we need to be asking ourselves early and frequent throughout the entirety of our careers. Do we like airplanes or do we like air power? You know, senior leaders who are involved in these discussions around accelerate, change, or lose need to be asking themselves, do I like this airplane? Do I like the A-10? Or do I like air power? And Congress too, right? Those who control the way that our programs are paid for and the laws that surround that, like with the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, do they like the airplane or do they like the Air Force's ability to project air power? Yeah. And I think that's our responsibility as officers to be able to answer that question and to be able to communicate the key difference, because that's something General Brown talks about, right? He talks about getting away from a platform-centric idea and perspective and onto a capability. And that's the difference in my mind a little bit for me. That's what I think about. It's not a platform, but a capability. That difference seems nuanced. It seems small, but it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, and I think that difference is what is allowing the RPA community to continue to innovate and evolve and take a different look at the way we apply air power, not just the tenets of air power, but the whole of the principles of war. And this is a conversation that we haven't had yet, but that we need to. What are the principles of war and how do we as an Air Force fit within that construct? How do we play within the joint fight? We do need to have that conversation, explore that a little bit deeper. But because they, as I understand it, at least from Mike's perspective, is that they love air power more than they care about the specific platform, whether it's the MQ-9 or the MQ-1 or the Global Hawk or anything that's going to come next or any of the sensors or the ordnance that they put on the aircraft. They are willing to do whatever it takes so long as it allows them to continue to accomplish their mission of a persistent air power, deterrence by detection being there at the right place at the right time all the time. I think having that perspective allows them to accomplish all these things far more effective than if they were just concerned about a particular platform or a specific airplane. 
another thing that builds off of that concept is how we didn't necessarily go this direction willingly as a service. Yeah. This was kind of forced upon us and and look at all the benefit and good that has come as a result. That was again one of the most interesting and profoundly meaningful discussions of air power I've listened to in a long time. What was it that really spoke to you, Reed? What why do you say that? You know, I came from Paycom and the employment of theater ISR. So the placement of MQ1, MQ9, RQ4, I have done that a lot. I, I know how that works. Yeah. And his perspective on how these assets can be used, especially in a great power competition, I found very insightful and enlightening and not focused on the platform. They were focused on the capability, the intent, the effect. Yeah. And that's something as an ISR professional, I've really tried to focus on and to get my planners away from thinking about platforms and toward thinking about effects. And so to have somebody on, quote, the other side, thinking and talking in that same language, I, I really appreciate it. Yeah. And being able to think and talk that way so clearly, so cogently is really powerful. And, you know, the multiple times that I've been able to listen to that interview now have been very instructive. And I would encourage our audience to do the same. Colin, that kind of leads me to one of the things I wanted to talk about just very briefly is one thing he mentioned when he was discussing about his time at the Air Force Academy is how he felt that there was a lot of value in bringing his experience to that experience, that training event, that, you know, that time. Yeah. But also learning from the experience of others and how beneficial that is. I really want to highlight how critical that is to our audience. Okay. No matter where you are, no matter where you're coming from, wherever you go, you are going to bring something unique and valuable to that training experience. I had this conversation a lot with my cadets at OTS, especially the civilians. We would sit down in a feedback session and they would say something to the effect of, oh, I'm just, I'm not really sure that I have much to contribute. You know, I haven't been deployed eight times like some of my enlisted counterparts. And I would have to point out to them that this civilian had experience that was valuable. That while these enlisted members were out deploying, you were off doing something else yeah. that they didn't experience. So everyone needs to bring what they have to offer, but they also have to be willing to listen to the experience and value from theirs. And if we can all do that, training is so much better. And I'm thinking particularly a training environment because that's where it seems to be yeah. occurring most often. But this can happen in your daily life as well. Yeah. The diversity of perspective and thought is really important. And to draw from Mike's interview, he talks closer to the end about how there was a point where we transitioned from the horse to the tank, right? And the military industrial complex took over and standardized all of the equipment that we have. But we are now at a point where we have the ability and there's a need to build variety into the machine, right? And if it's important for the machine to have variety and to be able to innovate and problem solve from different places and points, how much more important is it for we as humans to innovate and evolve and problem solve from different points of view and different perspectives. I would argue almost can't without the diversity. Yeah. I mean, we need to build variety into the officer corps. And that's what you're highlighting here, that we need differences in perspective from those who get into the military early. They enlist at 17, you know, they get the waiver from their parents to go to basic training at 17, right? And then they've been doing that for the last 10 years before they decide to cross over and earn their commission. We also need the 27-year-old who has been working in a lab as a microbiologist who brings that level of experience and different perspective on the world into the Air Force and there be a conversation between those two very different views of the world toward the same goal, the same end of applying air power on behalf of the American people and the Air Force. Yeah, totally agree. So I really wanted that message that he brought up. I wanted that to be highlighted because it's essential, absolutely essential. Yeah. And it's not just at the session source. This needs to happen every time you move units, that you get somebody new into an organization or something changes. You need to be aware of what it is that you bring 
to the fight, but also be open to what that new unit, that new person, that new situation is going to teach you and help you to become better in your profession as a member of the profession of arms. Totally agree. Colin, what was something that really stood out to you that you wanted to talk about? Well, along those lines and going back to the discussion around capability, I really enjoyed Mike's perspective on the capability of the officer and the purpose of an officer, especially in this environment where there's a lot of really high tech and very capable machinery going on that can automate a lot of different things. And he talks about how, with respect to the RPA, their primary mission is C2, command and control. But those two things should not be equated. And why we always put them together is a discussion for another time, but there may be reason to separate them and treat them separately. One of them being something that can be automatic and should be automated, which is control, the control of the aircraft and using a lot of the machine learning, artificial intelligence and the capabilities that are on board, the aircraft itself, what's possible in the cloud or with satellites and all that machinery to automate the, the control of the aircraft. But do not, and we should not, automate command. And that is really where the officer shines in their, their ultimate purpose in being part of the Air Force, part of the military. And I want to bring that out again for our audience so that we can emphasize this point. Officers exist to provide command. Okay. Yeah. He never answered the question, you know, why do we have to have an officer in flying? Not to my satisfaction, at least. Okay. So yes, I thought that was one of the best discussions about that concept I've had in a while. And I admittedly would love to engage with this more with a broader, diverse group of flyers, especially. I just, I still am not convinced that the reasons justify having an officer, you know, controlling the stick on every aircraft. In some, I absolutely, yes, I think, especially in aircraft where you are the only person in the aircraft, I can start to buy that, right? You have to make command decisions. But there are a whole lot of aircraft that are crewed that are doing pretty normal things. You know, mobility aircraft, uh, right? They're, they're just shots fired. And I don't want to belittle what they're doing. I don't want to minimize the importance. I just, I don't think that officers have a monopoly on decision making. They certainly don't. And that's the thing that I'm still having a hard time wrapping my brain around. What is it about my college degree that says I'm better at decision making than somebody else? And I don't know. Some could argue that the fact that you made the decision to get a college degree signals that you are not right for making decisions. Because if you really were evaluating all your options and making good decisions, you wouldn't have chosen to get a degree. You would have learned these things from outside of the academic environment, got practical experience, and that would have made you a better decision maker. Yeah. So it's something I think we struggle with. I still think we struggle with this as a service. I absolutely think there needs to be an enlisted corps. I think there needs to be an officer corps. I think those divisions are important. But I think, again, I keep anchoring on this and I need to break that bias, but it's the leadership aspect. And again, our enlisted members can and do lead. It's perhaps the responsibility that goes with it, right? Yeah. And he talks about that in the interview that yeah. ultimately the responsibility for the decisions that are made, and we've talked about this too, falls to the officer. That if you need to point at somebody who's ultimately responsible, the buck stops here, it's going to be the officer. Yeah. Not just the officer, but the commander. And he talks about one of the roles of the officer in the aircraft is to be the aircraft commander. Yeah, and the mission commander, absolutely. So, and I guess the question is, now with our increasing era of interconnectedness, do we still need an officer in every cockpit? I don't think so. And the flip side of that is, well, in an environment where we lose our ability to communicate, which would be the most likely result of a force-on-force -force conflict, right? GPS is gone. Data links are gone. Communications are gone because our enemies degraded those. You know, we need someone who can make command decisions. Okay, I'm listening. You know, I'm not completely opposed. I just, I think it's vanity to say that we are the only people in our force who can make good decisions. Yeah, certainly we have 
very capable enlisted counterparts who can and should be making a lot of the decisions that are frequently left to the officer. And I think that's something General Brown brings up in his paper we discussed in the last few episodes of pushing that responsibility down yeah. lower. Something that I have thought about is decentralized execution, Okay. right? Centralized control, decentralized execution. When you do push responsibility and decision making down, there still has to be some authority. I can see how that would lie with the officer corps. So again, I'm on both sides of this coin here. I think I feel like we need to have a bigger discussion as a service and bring all options to the table instead of just saying pilot equals officer, which is I feel like that's the conversation now. Yes, there are some enlisted RPA pilots specifically for the RQ4. I haven't heard if they're going to continue that program or not. Well, we've talked about how the RQ4 is probably going to go away if we're looking for ways to divest ourselves of legacy platforms and move towards capability. Yeah. The RQ4 is not going to be around forever. So I would love to hear you know, how that program's gone and if anybody learned anything. It's a fascinating topic, and I just wish we could bring all of those options to the table, but I feel like we're not. I feel like it's just, nope, pilot equals officer, and that's it. And that's the end of the conversation. And I think if we're going to progress into the future, we need to have a more nuanced discussion. Yeah, I think that what you're saying, pilot equals officer, is an emphasis on platform as opposed to capability. And we need to move away from that. Yeah. If the capability can exist in a different way, if the capability of effectively operating an aircraft can happen within the enlisted ranks, then let's explore that. But I think Mike's point here is that command specifically should and will always belong to the officer and should never be automated by a machine. And I wholeheartedly, completely endorse those perspectives, 100%. Could not agree more violently. Yes. But where is that command happening, right? I think those are all the questions. Yeah. And so, yeah, totally agree. To me, this is like a conversation I totally want to, you know, share a full sugar Coke with somebody in their beverage of choice, right? (laughs) Like sitting around having a conversation. Um, that's as hard as it gets for me, by the way, for our audience. That's, that's You know I'm really <laughs> throwing down when it's a full sugar soda. But, yeah, I think these conversations are important. I think it's really good to have these kinds of discussions and explore these ideas because we, Colin, you and I, and the Mike Burns's of the world, we are going to be the next people making these decisions for the Air Force. Right. Holy smokes. That's a little bit scary. But at the same time, like, it's a huge responsibility. Yeah. And so if we're going to make those decisions, they better be informed and we better have thought long and hard about it and put in the work. And, and so I'm super grateful for Mike coming on and, and bringing that stuff up. I think it's a challenging question to answer. And I think he did a pretty darn good job, even though I kind of disagree a little bit, but I think that's our job, right? Is to have the conversation. Yeah. And the conversation, it's not done. It's not over. It's not shut. The conversation will continue. As we engage with each other in the Heritage Room, we invite you to join us there. Go to airforceofficerpodcast.com and sign into the Heritage Room. We'd love to hear your opinions on where command should exist with respect to the operation of aircraft. Does it need to be in the cockpit or can it be placed elsewhere with awareness of what's going on and the ability to make those decisions? Or where should those decisions be made, but also where should the responsibility lie? Thank you to Major Mike Burns for coming on to the show. We left the door open for him to join us again later to share additional thoughts about the RPA community, what it's like to be an RPA pilot on the day-to-day, but loved the thoughts that he shared with us here from the 10,000, 50,000-foot view. Yeah, I would really love to, you know, talk about some of my deployment experience and, you know, shoot the watch, so to speak, and talk about, you know, my view of how they've been employed and how they've been misapplied in combat before and yeah I, I would love to have that conversation with Mike absolutely thank you so much Mike for joining us it was a pleasure and we look forward to talking with you again anything else Reed? nope and that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed Commission Ed